We all know who this is, so it's Amory Scott, <laughs> and uh, I think we need plenty more than 30 minutes to talk about uh, buying from EdTech, but uh, she says she's going to be able to do this in 20 and then leave time for questions or at least an early exit to get ready for the gala dinner tonight, so. Thank you, John, right. and yeah, thank you. Um, hopefully I'll get... Yeah, hopefully I'll get through this in about 20 minutes. This is a talk I've done a couple of times before at varying lengths in other places, so hopefully I can do this in 20. Um, first of all, I want to acknowledge that a lot of the thinking and work I'm going to talk about here was done while I was in Canada. It was done in a place called Tukemlips to Shikwetmik, the unceded and traditional lands of the Shikwetmik Nation, also known as Kamloops, British Columbia. For those of you who were in my keynote yesterday, where learning has taken place since time immemorial. And I think it's important, uh, just with the session we just heard, to recognize that learning and thinking takes place in a physical location. Um, so five things you need to know before you before you buy EdTech. Well, five things I think you need to know before you buy EdTech. This is not going to be a vendor management talk. I'm sorry if that's what you came from. <laughs> and if you work for a vendor, I'm very sorry. You may not like some of the things I'm going to say. Um, but I'm going to talk through um, five, five points that I, I think are important when we think about buying ed tech. And the reason I think they're important is because I hear a lot in the institutions I've worked with and in the work I do um, for the government of British Columbia about... Um, how does this stuff end up in our institutions? How, how, you know, suddenly I'm expected to use this digital technology that's just sort of appeared and I don't really know how it appeared and where it came from and what was the process of bringing it into the institution. And when I hear things like that, I start, because I'm senior administrator in institutions, I start to think about, well, you know, how, what's the, what are the processes by which this stuff comes into our institution and, and where may be the issues in, in those processes? Um, so that's really uh, where I started with this, starting to think about, well, why do people have these questions about where stuff comes from and, and who made the decision? Um, and then as I started to dig into to that, I started to think about procurement practice and the extent to which it slightly lives outside our sphere as learning technologists. Some of us might get involved in procurement, but, but it's sort of, you know, is driven maybe from somewhere else. Um, and I've, I've done quite a lot of work on this with a, a Canadian colleague, Dr. Brenna Clark Gray, who's at Thompson Rivers University. And we have a book chapter coming out on this um, in HE for Good, uh, edited by Laura Chenewich and Catherine Cronin, um, which I also name checked yesterday. Um, and please look for that when it's out. And it's something we continue to talk about. So what I'm going to talk about today is a kind of work in progress. Um, so this is why I want to have space at the end for a bit of discussion, because I've got questions and not all the answers at the moment. OK, so five five areas that I think are kind of interconnected and fundamental when we think about how ed tech comes to be in our institution. And, and I'm going to talk a little bit about possible solutions, but this is where I, I want you also to, to jump in. So my first proposition, if you like, is that ed tech is big business. And I don't think this should come as any surprise to us. There are a variety of economic influences, economic interests influencing the technologies that we use. Um, you can find updated versions of this slide from Holonic IQ, but it really shows you the, the investment in venture capital um, that's been pushed into the edtech market. Now, it's dropping off at the moment, but I would suggest that actually that shift of venture capital into AI and away from edtech is still in the edtech space. Um, there are some questions about whether there's a kind of edtech crash coming, but um, I think we have to accept that our field um, has been a space of, of venture capital speculation. And as the quote I've put on the, the screen there shows, the people who are speculating in this space are not necessarily aligned in values terms to the same things that we are aligned to. The other thing that influences ed tech markets is our own internal uh, thinking around digital transformation. And I'm glad I'm able to follow on from the previous session for those who were in here and, and, um, uh, and maybe some of you saw the JISC session earlier on digital transformation. We as institutions are pursuing digital transformation often as a way to grow our institutions to cope with scale or to think about um, new groups of learners that might join our institutions. And that could be international students, that could be people at a distance, but it could be micro credentials, it could be degree apprenticeships, it could be whole new products, if I can use that phrase. So, oh, and I've talked about supporting growth. So, 
Edtech companies have got a vested interest in influencing us and making markets for their stuff. And institutions have got a vested interest in edtech to support some of these bigger visions about growth and, and digitization. My second proposition is edtech is not a tool. Um, I fundamentally believe that the technologies that we use are a quality assurance matter. And that really draws on the concept of entanglement um, it, when we think about technology and pedagogy i cannot abide that diagram on the side it is complete fabrication you cannot separate technology and pedagogy from each other this quote from my colleague shan bain ex ex extends on that a little bit so yes we need to acknowledge that the two are co-constitutive of each other entangled in cultural material political and economic assemblages of great complexity you can't pick the two things apart um, and, and more recent work from uh, another colleague, Tim Fawns, where he has this neat diagram um, around entangled pedagogies. He again makes the same point that the reality, you know, you've got these two illusions of tech driving or pedagogy driving, but the, re the reality is that they act upon each other all the time. And they're also mixed up with other complex ideas about the purpose of education, the context in which education takes place and the values that we have as educators. So if you believe that technology and pedagogy aren't separate, and then you start to think about quality assurance frameworks, we're very good at assessing, very good, sometimes we're very good at assessing the quality of education. But when you look at a lot of quality assurance frameworks, they're looking at the learning and teaching activities and not looking at the technology piece. You'll look at who does the teaching. You'll look at what qualifications they have to do the teaching. But you don't look at what technology is used and you don't look at how the technology came into being. So we have this mismatch in our quality assurance practices. And if technology can act upon the quality of education and these kind of framings suggest it can, then I think we have a gap. So good use of technology is not as simple as picking the right tool and training people on how to use it. And quality assurance processes are not broad enough to really accommodate a proper evaluation of the technologies and, and that entangled impact. EdTech is not neutral. Um, it is absolutely driven by political ideologies of what education is, is for and about, and it's not an ethics free zone. And I suspect I don't need to tell this community about that, but I'm going to, cause I've got some slides on it. <laughs> so um, we, EdTech is often pushed at us as part of this bigger narrative that we're broken and that we need to be disrupted. Um, I do like to point out to Procter and companies who, tell us that the value of our degrees will be suspect without their tools, that I come from a 400 year old university that has survived two world wars. And that was just the 20th century bit of that university. We, we are not broken and, and do not need to be disrupted in the way that, that we are told. Um, but there is a, a series of political agendas here about what education is. Um, I, I mean, I think just again in the last session, we were talking about the push from the UK government at the moment to presenteeism on campus again. There are, there are absolutely political narratives in this space. Um, and we see this in the ed tech space as well. And there's a lovely quote from, again, American and Canadian colleagues about this financially driven about privatization of public structures, prepackaged deliverables and, and technology in and in a solution in and of itself, this kind of techno solutionism. I think that takes us into kind of interesting spaces when we think about risk. Um, we're now starting to see class action lawsuits in the US, uh, successful class action lawsuits from students um, who are, yes, well, as this one says, um, clearly making the case that large scale use of exam proctoring was a violation of their privacy and, and indeed the, the judge in this case found that it was. So students are pushing back on some of our use of ed tech. And this is my colleague Ian Link Linkletter, who was at the uh, at University of British Columbia, now at BCIT, who is being sued by Proctorio. He has been in and out of court for the last three years. So not only are our students pushing back on some of the ed tech we choose, if we don't choose it carefully, use it carefully. If we are critical of it, some companies are coming for us as well. Um, I think there's a whole new market in liability insurance for learning technologists, unfortunately. Um, and this actually, this, this quote from Neil Selwyn is really interesting because in he wanted to do some work on 
uh, on proctoring technologies. And it was around the time that Proctorio took the action against Ian and various journals wouldn't publish the research um, that he wanted to, education journals wouldn't touch it. And it was published in a media journal instead. So there was a chilling effect from that case on research as well. And I think at the point that we are not able to critically examine our own practice in our institution through our own applied research, because we are scared of, of legal action from, from vendors, um, is a, well, it's, it's not a good place to be. So um, EdTech is complicit in these narratives of disruption. It's presented a sol as a solution to all of our problems. Um, and I, I, ethics, I say, is a, a structural consideration in one area of ed, our education. We do a lot of ethics clearance in our research, um, but actually can be a really risky business to engage with in, in other parts of our, our organisations. We don't think about ethical approval in our operations um, in the way that we do in our research. And I think you know, the, the proctoring cases really show us that there is a, the bit, there is a big gap there. EdTech is killing us. I talked yesterday in my keynote about climate change. You cannot avoid it. Um, and technology excess of which EdTech is one small part um, is fueling increasing disadvantage in a climate crisis. We don't talk enough about the intersection between technology and climate. And that, that doesn't just apply to our field. Um, that applies to, to technology in general. But I think as educators, we really do have a responsibility in here. And for every single one of us whose universities have signed up to the Sustainable Development Goals, I find it quite difficult to think about how you're going to deliver environmentally conscious education um, and really think about underpinning those goals without thinking critically about the extent to which we need less ed tech. So this is, again, work from Neil Selwyn. Uh, this is a screenshot from a presentation he gave to colleagues at Edinburgh, but I really love this question he asked, is digital education part of a realistic livable future or even just a survivable planet? And if so, in what form? And since we've all entered a period of collective madness around AI, if any of you haven't read um, Kate Crawford's Atlas of AI, I would absolutely recommend it, or even just go and find the, the graphic that was designed, Anatomy of an AI, which really shows you the material processes involved in developing an artificial intelligence, the mining of rare minerals to, to create the data centers and the e-waste that exists at the other end of that process. Um, so yes, what? how much ed tech is too much ed tech? Um, I also like to think about where does OER fit when we're trying to be climate conscious? Do we, you know, should we be continually reinventing the wheel or is there a climate conscious argument around OER? I really think there are. Um, in my Canadian context, when I think about the relationship of uh, First Nations people to the land and the way they conceptualize that relationship, our, our commitments to decolonization, which has to include a responsible use of natural resources. And then how do we reach some of the most marginalized learners? Um, particularly, again, in my Canadian context, in areas of, that are very poorly served by internet access. Um, but you can apply that to other rural areas in, in Europe as well. So I think in Scotland, Tyree, the small island of Tyree has the best internet access in the whole of Scotland. Um, there's a couple of other papers which uh, have come out in the last year really starting to push on this. Our field, I think, has been um, pretty slow to really engage with the environmental arguments. Um, so this is a, a paper um, that talks about... Uh, yeah, talking about if you're going to talk about social justice in education, you can't really escape the use of minerals and the and e-waste and what that means uh, at a at a global level. That our use of digital education is actually impoverishing people and pushing people into um, dangerous work. Uh, and again, if you've read the Time article about how Jack GBT was trained and the kind of labour. Um, horrific labour that went into training chat VPT and the trauma that that's left behind it. I think that's just another example. Um, and digital literacies, again, coming back to, you know, we talk about digital skills, we talk about being able to make critical judgments but we, um, about our use of technology, but we never go quite as far as that critical judgment about not using technology. It's, it's always a choice between certain types of technology. We don't talk about not using it. Um, and again, we don't talk about you know, the, the lives of our phones and the lives of our computers and what, what they mean in material terms. So 
should we, <laughs> we're talking about quality assurance earlier, should we be assessing the environmental footprint of our courses as, as a design quality assurance, like we do with accessibility? And fundamentally, do we need more ed tech? Should we be using more trailing edge technology rather than bleeding edge technology? Which leads me to my final point. <laughs> when I think about the processes and the mechanisms by which this stuff comes into our institution, and I think about all the ways in which ed tech can be problematized, I think our procurement practices are fundamentally broken because we don't have any frameworks to help us navigate this territory. So what's missing? The kinds of things I think you're missing, you know, what's driving procurement? Where did it come from? Was it, is there market making happening? Did somebody come in and show us something shiny and now we want it? Are we being told all of our peers have it and now we have to have it? Who benefits and what are the costs? And let's get real about what the costs are. Um, can any claims of efficacy that are, are made actually be validated? Is there research that underpins the use of these tools? What are the risks of harm to staff and students? Are we gonna get sued? Are our students going to sue us? And then what about that sustainability piece? What, what are our obligations to the sustainable development goals? And are they real? And are they more about, are they about more than, you know, reducing our, turning the lights off at night and reducing our server consumption? Um, and this is a, a quote I've used in a blog, and I finally got it in print fairly recently. I have walked into God knows how many university rooms and seen fair trade tea and fair trade coffee and fair trade sugar. And we think more about the ethics of how we buy tea bags on our campus than we do about technology. We assume it's this neutral free zone. But that also gives me hope because that says that there are frameworks that we can use. Frameworks do exist. Um, and if we could create those kinds of frameworks, then I think we could start to solve some of this problem. However, I also think there's a bigger problem. <laughs> um, that public procurement, public sector procurement is driven by two things, transparency around use of public money. You've got to demonstrate good fiscal practices. And also um, you've got to be, uh, you've got to be uh, fairly competitive. Um, so you're really looking Th those, those are the risks that public sector procurement is trying to manage, that you've spent money wisely, that you've made a good choice, you haven't wasted public money, and that you, ha that you haven't um, pre prevented any company from coming forward with a, a, a product. Um, but I wonder whether there are, well, as I've said, I think there are other risks we're not managing in here. Um, and it's a huge amount of money that goes into public sector procurement. Um, and I, I don't know that we're meeting these standards. So I think, I think that we are often measuring what's easy to measure and that we're not assessing risk appropriately. And if I can, I'm gonna scoot back actually to, to Tim's model. When I think about, got too many slides. When I think about this piece here, this purposes, context, values piece, and I think about my experience of procurement and I think about writing uh, requirements, specifications and those functional requirements. What's become really clear to me is that those functional requirements are a very, very poor proxy for a set of very complex ideas about what we think education is. And I think about how I used to write some of those RFPs. Um, it was often a case of getting somebody else's who'd done a similar procurement recently and having a look at that and running some workshops and getting you know whoever was prepared to come forward um, and and tell us what they wanted but the conversation was often all about features all about functionality and not about these more complex ideas purpose context and values and I think we have a big gap here in that translation piece from those complex ideas about what we think teaching is and why we do it and, and what are what do you think good education is? <laughs> and then how does that manifest inside ed tech? And I, I think that is a big problem. I don't have an answer for it though. Um, let me scoot forward. I need to put that in my slides again. Okay, I do think we have some places that we can go though. Um, I see some things that are giving me some hope. The framework for ethical learning technology that Alt has worked on, I think is a great tool that gives us a place to start that reflective process. I think we need to expand our scope of reflection and I hope that the points I've you know, put, 
propositions are put um, in front of you. We'll do that a little bit. But I think if we go through some of this reflective process and just really think about what is driving what we're doing, why are we doing it? Do we need to do it? Do we need as much of it? Can we, can we um, embrace something we already have and use it differently? I think we, we could do more of that kind of thinking. It's also a really fascinating um, report I think really fascinating report from London School of Economics, um, which really looks at edtech procurement beyond higher education. It looks at the school sector as well. Um, it makes a number of recommendations and, and a number of final points, but I think there's some really interesting pieces in there about um, standards. Education stakeholders need standards to understand and choose edtech products with ease. Um, not every institution has learning technologists not every institution is equally provisioned with learning technologists so there are issues of equity in here I think without some of those standards um, I really like some of this stuff around ed tech companies adhering to more frameworks that we put in front of them policies terms and conditions now within national contexts we do this a bit in public sector procurement with shared procurement and negotiating terms and conditions but we could be stronger and this one I found really interesting ed tech products should be licensed to operate in educational institutions this I find interesting there are a few moves towards it in the US but in the EU and I mentioned this a little bit in my keynote yesterday, this, um, we're starting to see the beginning of the regulation of the software industry full stop. So some of the work I do in open source, I'm looking at the impact of the EU Cyber Resilience Act on open source communities. But that act is going to apply the CE mark to software and to digital products. So this is starting to put a safety stamp on software. And it's a digital security safety stamp, but it is the start of a regulation of the software industry. So I think about models like fair trade, which are to some extent a regulation of labor and working practices in, in other areas. And I think we are going to start to see um, some of this regulation and licensing coming in. And I think we need to be thinking about this and maybe trying to influence it. I'm very worried that um, educational institutions are not at all interested in the impact of the EU Act. Um, they don't seem to understand that it may have big impacts for open science and open research. So I think there are some things on the horizon that are interesting in this space, but there aren't solutions in front of us today. But I think there is, there is when we think about that, do we need more ed tech? I think we can, when we think about our post-pandemic cost of living space as well, I think we can also start to maybe shift our own thinking from um, a culture of excess which we've had to date to starting to think about constraints and I really like that this this book it's kind of marketing speak that it's written in but it says really good things I like you know the tone irritates me but the content is good um, but I really love this quote that don't see constraints as negative things they're, they're not punishment um, they can force us to question, surface and challenge our assumptions um, and things that might have been reasonable for us to do in the past um, may not be useful strategic foundations for us anymore. So can we start to think about using less ed tech or using maybe trailing edge technologies in more creative ways by taking that kind of constraint thinking and taking it as a, a design challenge? Um, rather than let's just buy a new shiny thing because there's another new shiny thing out there. I think we have a, a culture of excess and abundance and it's in some people's interest that we do. And I don't know that it's always in our interest. So I'm going to stop there. How are we doing for time, John? Did I rattle through that? Super we are, we've got seven minutes. Oh, okay. That was not too bad. That was rather fast. Um, that really is a <laughs> things that keep me up at night about <laughs> educational technology but I I would be really interested in any questions comments thoughts people have this is a space of evolving thinking for me I see gaps I see I see problems I see a need for frameworks um, I think am I wrong am I right I would really appreciate people's people's reactions but I also understand that it's 20 past five <laughs> so I'm not going to lock you in the room <laughs> Any questions? I'm sure there are. Thank you. That was um, really, really interesting. Well, wind. Um, <laughs> Sorry. But no, it's really, really interesting. Um, so my institution is currently in the process of doubling the number of institutional digital education tools that we have. And one of the things I found quite frustrating is not knowing what other institutions are using and what their experiences are. Yeah. Um, 
And I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on that and how we can um, kind of share our experiences, I suppose, and the kind of questions that we're asking and the kinds of answers that we're getting so that we're not all just doing the same thing. I, th I think that's a really great question. Um, and I'm, I'm going to scoot back to a slide with the one with the tea bags. So I cannot remember the detail. So take a note of this URL. <laughs> um, OK, because that article that the that I managed to get the quote into, um, does talk about a couple of services that exist in the US that do exactly that. It is a kind of place to pull information about what has worked. So I think there would be, you know, whether it's an alt thing, whether it's a JISC thing, whether it's a, you know, a sector level procurement agency thing, I, I think it could be in any and all of those spaces, but I absolutely agree. I think there could be a place to have a kind of what worked for us database kind of thing where you could capture beyond, beyond use cases, something that's tighter. And again, I think we'd have to have a conversation about what the format of that would need to look like, what would be useful. Um, but yes, what worked, what didn't. We bought this and it, it, you know, it made this promise and it didn't deliver in this way or it made this promise and it did or we bought it for this reason and it actually turned out to be really good for that. I think we talk about it. We do lots of presentations at places like Alt. We publish stuff out on our own websites. But I think, yes, a searchable kind of database a managed source of that information would be really valuable. And there are a couple of models in the US to point to. Um, kind of following on from that question, um, I remember it came up when we were looking, when, like the felt framework was being developed and there was mention of approved vendors or approved tools and things. And that was kind of very quickly knocked back as no, you know, that's not, not a kind of valid thing to do at this point. And you're right, like a database would be great, but how can you do something like that and still protect learning technologists and make them feel safe? to criticize without being worried about the fallback of that criticism like we've seen you know how do we create a database that's suitably anonymous but still respected you know it's not just a google review with no name on it but you know you know that you're getting good advice from people without them putting their careers or, or other things at risk i think that's where um i think that's you make a really great point um I think that's where sector level agencies are important because that's how you can have some anonymity. It's published by an organization, but you're right that behind that is always the threat of illegal um, action, I think. And that for me highlights a bigger issue about who's in control of our education system. When we are scared to talk about whether something works for us or doesn't work for us um, because we're scared of legal action, who's running the university at that point and if you if you don't know um my colleague ben williamson from edinburgh um and, and some of some of his colleagues um who research in this particular space they, they're digital sociologists and researching the extent to which platformatization of um of the education system is really starting to exert a governing control and a behavioral control on education systems so i would definitely go and look at his work but but I think you highlight a really interesting tension, uh, our freedom to speak on this stuff. But but fun, but at a basic level, I think this is where sector level organization can provide some of that anonymity um, and can do some of that quality assurance piece of, you know, we've checked that it's somebody bona fide from within the education system, you know, but we're not going to put their name on it. But this hasn't come in from left field from somewhere else as well. So there's a sort of gatekeeping effect there. Um, but yes, the extent to which somebody is prepared to do that and take the, the potential uh, legal risk is also, I think, a question. Final question, perhaps? Oh, thank you. I'm yeah. full of doom. Yes, <laughs> today and today. I'm full of doom. <laughs> I'm quite a cheery either. kind of doom, I think. In a way. I'm quite <laughs> a cheery <laughs> doom, <Monday>, yes. <laughs> um, I just want to say thank you, first of all. It was really um, eye-opening to a certain extent, the, the information that was discussed there so I in in the institution I work for um the Open University UK um we I'm a learning designer in the STEM faculty so I um when we do certain design sessions that involve tools for example and we're thinking about third-party tools that aren't 
owned or kind of de developed in-house, then mm -hmm. we often go through a set of questions with mo module teams. So for example, does the tool share user information with others? You know, has the tool been tested for accessibility? What are the values of the company that that, that make the tool, et cetera? Mm -hmm. But it kind of inspired me to think about, do we do that for the tools that, that, that are currently being used? I'm not sure if we do or not. And I think that's a useful kind of point of reflection for me to take back in terms of how I initiate that conversation with my seniors and so on so yeah I just wanted to thank you for that no thank you I think that's a really that's a really great point we have and I say this as somebody who is a bona fide advocate for open source we we tend to use open as a shortcut for good and I don't think that it always is either and it certainly falls down again in a decolonial context and my Canadian context but yes I, I, I think we have to recheck our assumptions and in all cases and and you know what you've what you've explained there in terms of the kinds of questions you use you have a standard rubric for this stuff i think about my training in data protection and the kind of um, legitimate interest balancing tests that you use so it's not a black or white answer it's uh what is the common good versus the impact on individual privacy and you weigh that up to determine if you've got a legitimate interest to use that data we could use those sorts of frameworks and thinking for um, AI and the potential harms versus the potential benefits, massive environmental and IP and horrible harms over here, massive potential for accessibility over here. When do we use AI and when do we not use AI or generative AI in particular? I think there are things we've already got, which if we could just tweak them a little bit, um, would, would serve us quite well in that space. I do think these frameworks are, are within our grasp. If we choose to knuckle down and do the work, we've got we've got models to follow. So I think that's a really great point. Thank you. I'm afraid we're probably out of time. Oh yes, go so and have a gala dinner and don't Please listen to me. Please go and get dressed and get ready for the gala dinner. But thank you so much. Thank you.